Good evening. On behalf of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service and UW Marathon County, we welcome you to tonight's Veninga Lecture on Religion and Society, Religious Freedom for All in a Polarized Age. My name is Julie Buncheck, and I'm the Program Manager at WIPS. The Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service is a unit of the UW Colleges and UW Extension and was founded in 2007 here in Wausau. Our mission is to address local, state, and national issues by linking public scholarship, civic outreach, and student service to enhance community life throughout Wisconsin. We believe that the strength of American democracy in the 21st century depends on the engagement of citizens and communities in making decisions about issues that matter to them. To this end, WIP's task is to provide resources, information, and ideas to empower the people and communities of Wisconsin. The Beninga Lecture is named after a much beloved dean of the campus who was also a religious studies professor. Jim Beninga was instrumental in acquiring the resources for constructing this building, and the theater here is named after him. He was also a founding father of WIPs. Beninga's vision was to bring nationally acclaimed experts in the field to address topics that often are emotionally charged. Although he died in January 2014, his vision lives on through all of WIPs programs, but most especially through his namesake religion and society lecture series. His hope was that people learn from some scholars who have thought deeply and written widely about the connections between religion and society at home and abroad. Tonight's program would not be possible without the hard work of our planning team, including Deb Dorhorst, Eric Giordano, Matt Froome, and Aaron Zitzelberger. We are grateful for the technical support from theater technician Chris Berg, and we thank all the WIPS interns who are helping us tonight. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for this event, Church Mutual Insurance, Bremer and Trollop Law Offices, the BA and Esther Greenheck Foundation, Mark and Ann Bradley, Chris and Paul Bremer Moogley, Linda and Lane Ware, and UW Marathon County. We also want to recognize those of you who have generously contributed to WIPs over the years. Programs like this would not be possible without your support. If after our program tonight you are challenged, inspired, moved, or otherwise enjoyed the event, we encourage you to make a donation to WIPs. WIPS is a self-supporting organization and depends on the generosity of its supporters to survive and thrive. Thomas Berg grew up in Chicago and received a bachelor's degree in journalism from Northwestern University, a master's degree in philosophy and politics from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and both an MA and religious studies, an MA in religious studies and a JD from the University of Chicago. He is the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he teaches constitutional law, law and religion, intellectual property, and the Religious Liberty Appellate, Appellate Clinic. He has written numerous chapters, journal articles, and op-ed pieces on religious freedom, constitutional law, and the role of religion in law, politics, and society. His work has been cited several times by the U.S. Supreme Court and federal courts of appeals. His talk this evening is titled Religious Liberty for All in a Polarized Age. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thomas Berg. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and uh, thank you to Julie and to Eric for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, thank you to the sponsors, too, for making this possible, and to all of you for coming out. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing these, uh, I think, very interesting and challenging issues uh, tonight. So let's get started. Let me, uh, let me start off with breaking news, a news flash. America today is deeply polarized between competing political cultural outlooks. You didn't know that, I bet, right? The New York Times reports that, quote, members of the two parties are more likely today than at any time in the last 50 years to describe each other as selfish, as threats to the nation, and as unsuitable marriage material. 
Uh, um, as a recent book described, Americans are experiencing a big sort, that's the title of the book, in which ideological homogeneity increasingly characterizes the online sources that we read, the political party we join, and even the neighborhood where we reside. We don't talk to each other across political lines as much as we used to. Recently, the list of issues that polarize us has come to include a basic constitutional value, religious freedom. We've seen several high profile uh, cases of laws clashing with religious tenets and practices. The Obama administration's mandate that employers cover contraception in uh, insurance, challenged by companies like Hobby Lobby and charities like the Little Sisters of the Poor. Clashes between non-discrimination laws and those who object to supporting same-sex marriage in the context of Catholic adoption agencies or wedding-related businesses like the photographer or the cake baker whose case is now before the Supreme Court. In those cases, cultural conservatives face restrictions on their religious liberty as against progressive-oriented laws. But the positions flip in disputes over the treatment of Muslims. There, many conservatives favor discriminatory restrictions on religion, on a religion, through measures like President Trump's just expired ban on travel from six overwhelmingly Muslim nations. In all of these cases, disputes over religious liberty increasingly trace and even intensify the divides over the underlying policy issues, whether that's sexual morality, health policy, immigration, national security. If you support LGBT non-discrimination laws, you reject any religious liberty challenges to those laws. If you support immigration restrictions, you reject any religious liberty challenges to the immigration restrictions. Both left and right do it. This is a bad development, and that is my thesis tonight. We must renew our commitment to religious freedom for all. And that proposition has two parts. First, we should place a strong value on religious freedom which I define as the ability of people to live consistently with their religious beliefs and identity, uh, presumptively free from government penalty. Notice I don't say absolutely free, but presumptively free from government penalty for doing so. Now, we have to balance that freedom with other values, surely, but it should receive heavy weight in the balance. The second point is that that strong freedom must extend equally to all faiths. We need to protect Muslims and conservative Christians. Today, more than ever, Americans need to affirm what Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes called freedom for the thought we hate. So this talk is gonna have three parts. Uh, first, I'll describe the situation, the sharp divide between conflicting ideologies over religious freedom and some of the legal principles that affect that divide. Second, I'll give several reasons why it's important to protect religious freedom strongly and for all. And finally, I'll argue that it's possible to protect religious freedom meaningfully while still giving weight to competing interests. We can reach solutions that protect both sides, and I'll suggest some principles for doing so. So there are the three uh, points tonight. So first, what is the problem? Let's begin with treatment of Muslims. Republicans often defend religious freedom, and rightly so. But there is a big counterexample. Their voters and activists, statistically, are inclined to limit freedom and equality for Muslims. When candidate Donald Trump called for, quote, a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's rep representatives can find out what's going on, that proposal received support, according to polls, from 71% of Republicans. Trump eventually adopted the more limited ban on travel from six countries, 
But the original proposal, which would have facially targeted the entire Muslim religion, was also very popular. Support for blocking the construction of mosques is also significant and is driven by activists and local politicians in various places. They've also led efforts to ban Sharia law in the United States, um, efforts that would uh, respond to a very doubtful threat, in my view, a very you know, dubious and questionable threat, by, for example, forbidding Muslim business owners to arbitrate their disputes with each other according to the ethics of their religious belief, their shared ethics, while permitting Christians that right. There are Christian arbitration uh, agreements and Christian arbitration services where businesses whose owners are Christians can arbitrate their disputes on biblical principles. The Sharia law provisions would prevent Muslims from doing the very same thing. HUD Secretary Ben Carson maintained for some time that a Muslim should not run for president. And President Trump and Carson and other Republicans have called for intensified surveillance of mosques. Some conservative leaders like Russell Moore of the Southern Baptist Convention have spoken in favor of Muslims' religious freedom, but Moore faced withering attacks for doing so. As one news article put it, Christian conservatives have grown less sympathetic to Muslim religious freedom at exactly the moment that their rhetoric on behalf of religious freedom has grown more thunderous. Now let's turn to disputes the other way. Conservatives raising religious liberty claims against laws forcing them to fund contraception coverage or assist same-sex weddings. These cases span a wide range of situations and I think they call for a variety of results according to the situation. But progressives and liberals, at least the most vocal ones, are increasingly hostile, not just to particular claims, but to the idea of giving religious liberty any weight when the religious conduct in question is discriminatory. So the Democratic Majority Commission on Civil Rights, the US Commission on Civil Rights, issued an official report finding that any kind of religious, religious conscience exceptions from non-discrimination laws significantly infringe upon civil rights and therefore must be narrowly confined. The commission's chair went further, writing separately, he dismissed religious liberty claims in the civil rights context as hypocrisy. And I'm quoting again, code words, he said, for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and Christian supremacy. Now, again, there's a wide range of situations that invoke civil rights laws, everything from the cake baker at one end to, discriminate, to uh, uh, churches uh, having rules about who can serve as a minister in the church. Uh, and they may call for different results, but we're hearing a lot uh, of dismissals of the very idea of religious exceptions in any context of discrimination. Understanding these divides requires looking at the legal background. So I'm going to commit the, uh, the, the, the sin of engaging in some discussion about law here for a while, so forgive me. The prime constitutional question on religious liberty has concerned laws that do not single out religion on the face or in the text of the law, but that nevertheless clash with a religious practice in a particular case usually the practice of a religious minority, because the laws usually reflect majoritarian values. So the question has been, should courts look beyond the face of the law to see how it restricts religion in the particular case? Often this would mean declaring that in that particular case, the law can't be applied to penalize a religious practice at least unless doing so serves a very good reason. The government has to have a good reason for restricting religious practice. And from the 1960s through the 1980s, the US Supreme Court uh, did this. It protected religious, uh, 
conduct, religious exercise and practice, uh, unless the restriction was necessary to serve what the court said, called a compelling governmental interest. Compelling uh, sounds and was a, a high standard uh, for the government to meet. In 1990, however, the Supreme Court decided a very important case called Employment Division versus Smith. Uh, it ruled in that case uh, that a general law prohibiting the drug peyote could be applied to Native Americans who consumed that drug as the sacrament of their worship service. Uh, and that was regardless of whether there was a strong reason in that case for applying the law. Is there trafficking in peyote? Were Native Americans engaging in recreational use or widespread use? None of that mattered because the Supreme Court said the law was neutral towards religion and generally applicable. Now this decision, many people read it could, uh, and, and can very well be read to say the Supreme Court was giving up on any real protection of religious minorities against laws that don't explicitly target them. The peyote law wasn't enacted to target Native Americans, but it did very seriously restrict them in the particular case. Right. Congress responded to this decision in 1993 by passing a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act which I'll refer to as RIFRA. And that reinstated the rule that any burden, substantial burden on religion, had to be justified by a strong reason, whether the law originally targeted religion or not. Inter the, 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 here's what I want to draw from this. The, the, uh, the, the votes for that law in Congress in 1993 were essentially unanimous. Liberals and conservatives alike emphasize the importance of protecting religious freedom, the need to protect it in all cases. And in the next few years, uh, more than a dozen states enacted their own versions of this same statute to protect religious freedom. 20 years later, however, RIFRA and its state versions of it enacted in the states have become highly controversial, toxic, Indiana's enactment of its RIFRA in 2015 prompted widespread outrage on social media and boycott threats by organizations from Yelp to the NCAA. In 1993, President Bill Clinton signed the original RIFRA with an accompanying statement calling the law majestic and commending the, quote, the shared desire uh, that it reflected to protect perhaps the most precious of American liberties, religious freedom. In 2015, Hillary Clinton condemned the Indiana version, tweeting uh, after it was enacted that it was, quote, sad that this new law can happen in America today. These two refers were virtually identical. The Indiana text 20 some years later, explicitly included a couple of propositions that the courts had declared in interpreting the previous statute. But for the, for the most part, they were uh, essentially identical. What happened in between the two were the disputes over the contraception mandate and gay rights. Hobby Lobby relied on the federal RIFRA to gain protection in the Supreme Court from having to cover uh, methods of contraception that it feared could cause abortions of new embryos. Some proponents of the Indiana RIFRA 20 years later, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in 2015, clearly wanted to protect the small photographer or the florist from having to serve a same-sex wedding. And gay rights groups fiercely opposed that and warned that the law would allow a restaurant owner to refuse to seat a same-sex couple or serve a same-sex couple. So these disputes turned the RIFRA uh, by 2015 into a toxic subject. This, I think, is an overreaction. The major effect of these laws by far is to protect minorities in settings completely different from the non-discrimination disputes. 
These statues over the years have protected Native American students who wanted to wear long hair in public schools as a matter of their uh, uh, faith. Muslim prison inmates seeking to wear a trim beard uh, as an act of faith, and multiple religious ministries serving the homeless in shelters or public parks and blocked from doing so by zoning laws. And the negative effects of these refers, I think, have been greatly uh, overstated. Uh, to take just one example, whether or not the small wedding photographer or baker should be protected, which I'll discuss in a minute, they have lost most cases, even under these statutes. There is zero chance, as there should be zero chance, that a restaurant would get an exception under one of these laws from having to serve uh, a same-sex couple equally. I'm confident about that. Uh, that. That situation would be unconnected to any kind of a religious setting like a wedding, and the, co the courts, I'm confident, would, uh, would rule against the religious exception in that case. Nevertheless, you can't get a religious freedom statute passed in the United States now because they're so controversial. The upshot of that review, to make a long story short, I think both left and right treat religious freedom selectively. So that's point number one. Uh, point number two, this is bad. Hmm? Okay, let's move on to point number three, okay. Uh, religious, why is it bad? Religious liberty is designed, among other things, to provide a set of ground rules so that people of fundamentally different views can coexist. It should make room, within reason, for all persons to express and live consistently with their deepest views. We may clash on the underlying issues from healthcare to immigration, but we can respect the ground rules that allow people to pursue their different views on those uh, uh, issues. We can all enjoy civil liberties and support those civil liberties for each other. But this key purpose of religious liberty will fail if debate over the ground rules simply replicates the polarization over other issues. And today, religious liberty disputes are doing just that. They actually aggravate the underlying fights. Each side now resents the other side, not just for being wrong on the basic issue, but for we being willing to override and ride roughshod over religious freedom to promote their view on the issue. So the religious freedom disputes are aggravating things. We need to support religious freedom, therefore, as a crucial value that should be strong for all, not just for the side that we have sympathy to. Let me argue that through the prism of one of today's most polarizing conflicts between same-sex marriage and conservative religious objections. I have filed briefs and written articles over the years, filed briefs in court cases and written uh, articles over the years in support of both of those rights, including a brief supporting the same-sex couples in the Supreme Court's marriage case, why? Uh, and one supporting the cake baker in the current case. And I think it's ironic and sad that these two rights are seen as fundamentally incompatible because in fact, they involve essentially parallel claims. The strongest features of the case for same-sex marriage, and I think they are strong, show, also show a strong case for protecting the religious liberty of dissenters. Let me work through some of these parallels and uh, uh, kind of one by one. The first feature in common concerns the importance of personal identity. Both same-sex couples and committed religious believers argue that some aspects of human identity are so fundamental that they should be left to each individual, free of all non-essential regulation, even when that shows itself in conduct. For same-sex couples, the conduct at issue is to join personal commitment, sexual expression, day-by-day -day life together in a multifaceted, intimate relationship with the person they love. In the same-sex marriage case, the Supreme Court said 
that these decisions about marriage are among the most important an individual can make, including men and women and two men or two women. But religious commitment is no less a central feature of personal identity. Religious believers seek to live and act consistently with the commands of the being that they believe made us all and holds the whole world together. When the law requires them to violate their faith, they face a painful choice between authorities. They may fear punishment for violating God's norms. At the very least, they feel the loss of the highest form of fulfillment. Moreover, as the marriage relationship is per pervasive in a person's life, so too is religious commitment. Through what other single institution or belief system can a person do all of the following things? Raise and educate her children, mark births and deaths, meet weekly for sessions of inspiration and teaching, seek personal counseling from a leader, receive moral guidance for her conduct, and devote time to serving others. Second feature in common is that this identity is painful to change in both cases. No person who wants to enter a same-sex marriage can change his sexual orientation by any simple act of will. But neither can any religious believer change his understanding of divine command by any simple act of will. Religious beliefs can change over time, Far less commonly, sexual orientation can change over time, but these things don't change because government says they should, or because the individual simply up and decides that they should. For most people, their sexual orientation and their understanding of what God commands are experienced as involuntary. It's painful, at the least, to change. Third, of uh, commonality. This identity is closely tied to conduct. The states that refused same-sex marriage tried to argue that they treated people differently based not on their orientation, but on their conduct. In essence, they said that a gay man was not being discriminated against by the denial of marriage rights because he could marry a woman. Uh, and the Supreme Court, I think rightly, rejected that position. They said that the orientation and the conduct following from it are both central to a person's identity. But religious believers face similar attempts to distinguish their religious beliefs from the conduct based on those beliefs and to treat their conduct as the kind of thing that the government just has the right to regulate, period. Critics sometimes say to the religious claimant, you can believe whatever you want, but don't act on it. But believers can't fail to act on God's will, and it's no more reasonable for the state to demand that they do that than for the state to demand celibacy of all gays and lesbians. Both religious believers and same-sex couples feel compelled to act on those things that are constitutive or central to their identity. That's the third parallel. Fourth parallel, this conduct that's involved for both groups is not merely insular and private conduct. Both same-sex couples and religious dissenters seek to live out their identities in ways that are public. That is, socially apparent and sort of publicly acknowledged, socially acknowledged. Same-sex couples claim a right beyond private behavior in the bedroom, a right to live outside the closet, to participate in the social institution of civil marriage. Religious believers likewise claim a right to follow their faith, not just in an insular setting of worship services, but in other settings, in the charitable work that they do, in the adoption agency or other social services, and in their daily lives. That's the fourth parallel. A fifth parallel. Both same-sex couples and religious dissenters face the problem that what they experience as among the highest virtues is condemned by others as a grave evil. Where same-sex couples see loving commitments of mutual care and support, many religious believers see disordered conduct that violates scripture or natural law. And where those religious believers see in their opposition that they are being obedient to a loving God who undoubtedly knows best when he lays down these rules for conduct. 
Many supporters of gay rights see intolerance, bigotry, and hate. Because gays and lesbians and religious conservatives are each viewed as evil by a substantial portion of the population, each is subject in different parts of the country in this mosaic of places that we all live in, each is subject in some places to substantial risks of intolerant and unjustifiably burdensome regulation. A classic American solution to this problem is to protect the liberty of both sides. There's no reason to let one side oppress the other. If you believe that the court was right to recognize same-sex civil marriage, as I do, you should also recognize strong rights for dissenting religious organizations and individuals, and for religious liberty in other contexts, too. So that's point number two. Religious liberty is important, should be recognized, and in many ways is parallel. If we could perhaps see some commonalities between these conflicting claims, we might be able to look across at the other side with a somewhat greater degree of sympathy. Third, then, what do we need to emphasize religious liberty for all and protection of the liberty of all? First of all, uh, I'm going to say three things about that. First, we need to be alert to the multiple ways in which religious liberty can be threatened. And very often that threat comes from, as I've said before, laws that don't mention religion on their face, but nevertheless, in a particular case, create a conflict or a discrimination or an inequality. We should protect all religions against that kind of, uh, those kinds of burdens, at least where the government doesn't have a good reason for doing it. Um, these RIFRA laws that I've been talking about have gotten a bad rap, I think. And because for the most part, what they do is protect religious minorities against unnecessary regulation. And they've very seldom been read to go overboard. We should be uh, open to these kinds of laws that protect religious liberty for all. The recently expired travel ban, I believe, also shows the need to look behind a law that doesn't mention religion on its face in a different way. Although the order didn't say Muslim on its face, there's strong evidence that it was substantially motivated by an intent to harm Muslims, beginning with uh, President Trump's campaign promise of the complete and total shutdown of Muslims entering the country. I think you trace it and you make a very good case that what ultimately was done was a fulfillment of a campaign promise that, was a, that it was a highly discriminatory and hostile campaign promise, even if the, the version that came out later was different. Courts reviewing laws that harm a race or a sex are willing to look behind its neutral face, not mentioning race or sex, but to see what the intent is. They should do the same with the intentional singling out of a religious group. And that's why I think that the challenges to the, the president's travel ban, which are now no longer, uh, uh, probably maybe no longer viable because it's been changed just in the last couple of weeks, but they, they might still be. Uh, but those challenges were, were, were good challenges. Uh, the intentional singling out of a religion even if you don't do so in the absolute text of the law, should be uh, prevented. And conservative Christians should stand up for Muslim religious freedom. They should do it in order to have credibility when asserting their own. Laws hostile to one large, historic, and diverse faith, like Islam, can easily set the precedent for analogous laws against another. Uh, as one observer put it, conservatives may need to choose between opposing Islam and advocating for religious freedom. To wage both fights at the same time is likely to become increasingly awkward. So there's the first aspect. Uh, uh, laws and, and, and rules of, 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 of law that protect all faiths. Second aspect of protecting liberty for all is to seek win-win solutions for both sides in a conflict. The uh, most immediate way of doing that in the context of gay rights and religious objections 
would be to, uh, for legislatures to enact non-discrimination legislation, protecting LGBT people while also providing meaningful exemptions for religious organizations. Not just houses of worship, not just the insular setting of the church congregation or the, uh, the congregation on Saturday or Sunday, but also religiously affiliated schools, social services, other arms that bring religion out into the civil society. Let's hold for a moment the question about the small business. This kind of law, gay rights protection plus religious exemptions, passed uh, recently in a state that you might not expect. What's the last state to pass gay, uh, statewide protection for gay and lesbian people? Utah, okay? Deep Red Utah now protects LGBT people against employment and housing discrimination throughout the state while also exempting religious organizations. That happened because those two things went together. Uh, Utah, and, and it could happen elsewhere too. We could achieve that goal of protecting both sides. Utah had characteristics that made it unique. Uh, that's true, that'll make uh, the accomplishment of that same task difficult elsewhere. The Mormon church, the LDS church, threw its weight behind this protect both sides approach. Uh, and there's probably no church that has as much influence in any state as the LDS church does in Utah, obviously. Uh, but Utah shows possibilities for how to proceed in other states. Negotiation is in the interest of both sides. In 30 states right now, LGBT individuals have no statewide protection against being fired or denied service. As it's often put, you can get married on Saturday and fired on Monday. Where there is protection in the remaining 20 states, blue states, right, and municipalities elsewhere, Madison, obviously, in Wisconsin, gays already enjoy wide social acceptance and toleration and, and acceptance in those places anyway. Where laws are needed for them is in the places, is in the, the more red states. Religious exemptions in non-discrimination legislation would make it easier to pass in several states and at the federal level. Yet a few years ago, many gay rights organizations withdrew support for any kind of exemption beyond the very narrow case of employing clergy. Again, that kind of narrow insular situation. I think that Barney, Representative Barney Frank is right when he criticized those leaders uh, for making the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, now, on the other side, what's religious conservative? How should religious conservatives think about these, this issue and the question of gay rights legislation with protections for religious organizations? Many of them refuse to consider gay rights laws at all but they're ignoring that they're facing a ticking demographic time bomb. Not only do most Americans now support same-sex marriage rights, but each successive generation supports them more strongly. And they may become increasingly inclined to dismiss religious liberty as a cover for bigotry. More and more people may come to think that. If conservatives refuse gay rights laws with exemptions now, they will likely be stuck later with gay rights laws and no exemptions. So, win-win solutions. Is it possible? It's very difficult, but it happened in Utah. The third and final aspect of protecting all is to develop proper, sensible principles for determining the boundaries of religious freedom versus societal interests and others' rights. And this may be the hardest question of all. Religious freedom is not unlimited. The interests of others must be considered. As a matter of principle, they have to be considered. Also, as a matter of pragmatics, society won't respect your rights, ultimately, if you don't uh, show any respect for the rights of others. So 
S strong arguments for religious freedom have to acknowledge its limits as well. I can only touch on that briefly here, um, but I'll talk about a couple of cases. Courts deciding religious freedom cases should consider various factors. There are many things that go into that. The severity of the harm to others, uh, the closeness of the religious, as, religious activity to the core of religion. We've talked about how houses of worship get the most protection. It's very unlikely that a church will ever be forced to recognize a same-sex marriage or conduct a ceremony. Very unlikely. The baker is at the other end of the spectrum and does need to be treated under a different analysis, at least. Overall, when an individual or organization claims an exemption from non-discrimination law based on religious conscience, the effects on others can be mitigated or controlled by a couple of factors at least. Notice of the religious claimant's policy and the availability of alternative providers. So let me just talk about a couple of cases in the light of those two factors and then I'll wind up. The first case involves a California bill last summer that would have withdrawn statutory protections in state law uh, for religiously affiliated colleges that adhered to their tenets about sexual conduct and sexual identity, whether it was transgender or same-sex conduct. The bill was introduced in response to a handful of stories of Christian colleges expelling students for same-sex behavior or assigning transgender students to housing based on their bio biological sex at birth rather than their uh, declared gender identity. The bill would have eliminated exemptions for any college whose students received what are called Cal Grants. And Cal Grants is the state version of Pell Grants. So grants from the, from the state government for low income, uh, modest income students. The bill provoked furious charges that it would not only violate religious liberty, but also discriminate against minority communities because the colleges that were affected, conservative Christian colleges, served a disproportionately high number of particularly Hispanic students. So facing those kinds of arguments about the religious college's contributions, the bill's sponsor narrowed it down, pared it down, cut out the, the, the major uh, uh, restrictions, but he left in a requirement that colleges give notice of their policies against same-sex or transgender conduct. And I think that that makes sense. It's important that clients or employees of religious organizations have notice of the religious practices that could affect them and that could conflict with uh, applicable laws. Without notice, they may find themselves subject to unexpected standards of conduct that they can't easily escape. So it was legitimate that the California bill retain provisions designed to ensure that LGP students know the college's policies before deciding whether to attend. An organization that holds itself out as religious usually gives that kind of notice, but not always. Uh, I don't, the language doesn't have to be necessarily highly specific, uh, but there should be some form of notice. The second concept uh, besides notice is alternatives. So if we think about that uh, aspect of the case, how does the California College's case look? Alternative providers make possible avoidance of the religious rules. When such alternatives exist, the government's interest in forcing the religious organization to violate its tenets is reduced. Uh, uh, re uh, religious organizations can be denied exemptions when they would occupy choke points, what I've and I and some other analysts of this have called choke points, where they have a real sort of power in the market to uh, deny services, but where there are many alternative providers, the case for imposing seriously on their religious tenets is greatly reduced. And that was the case with the colleges in California. They were part of a much, much larger group of colleges, religious and secular, most of which have no uh, objection to same-sex or transgender students. 
they had, those students had multiple options. The harm that the, would, the regulation would have done to religious college students, the ones receiving the Cal grants who would lose their access, uh, was in my view not sufficiently justified given that fact. Okay, so notice and alternatives, uh, uh, you know, as applied to the California case, if the college provides notice, then the fact that there are other many, many alternative providers means that it's not a good enough case for overriding the college's ability to follow its tenets. Now last, what about the for-profit business? From the small baker and wedding photographer on up. In that sphere, protections for refusal of service need to be, if they are granted at all, need to be limited and carefully defined. Now, I'm going to argue that there should be an exemption, but it does need to be limited and carefully defined. There's a strong interest in ensuring that all people have ready access to goods and services without being repeatedly rejected out in the marketplace. But I would recognize a right to refuse in a small and a limited category of cases. Individuals and small businesses who object to providing personal services, personal services, wedding photography, the photographer providing the service, designing the floral arrangement, marriage counseling directly with a couple, that in cases where that would directly facilitate a ceremony or a relationship that they regard as having religious significance and as being wrong. And I would do that only when other providers are readily available. That, uh, I think, makes for a class of cases in which the provider's interest is stronger than the, the uh, client's interest or the customer's interest. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, the, I think that does cover the baker in the cake shop case that's currently before the Supreme Court. He said he would provide a cake to a same-sex couple for any reason other than a wedding because he regards marriage as a God-ordained relationship of a man and a woman. That providing that personal service is uh, the case where uh, the, this individual who's directly providing it uh, understandably feels the most personal responsibility. And the harms from the refusal that, the, that their refusal causes, I believe, are inherently limited if we define that category narrowly. So one harm from the refusal is material. The customer loses access to the goods or service or incurs material cost in obtaining them elsewhere. That would be a significant harm, for example, in a rural area with few providers. But in Masterpiece, which arose in metropolitan uh, Denver, the couple quickly obtained a cake from another baker. One brief filed in the case counted dozens of nearby bakeries whose websites indicated they served same-sex weddings. And that's not surprising. Most jurisdictions with gay rights laws will have few shops that are inclined to refuse good money from same-sex couples. The other harm, though, is the one that's really at the nub of the case here, and that is the dignitary harm. The, the insult or indignity of being refused service. In particular, being refused service because of the vendor's religious or moral disapproval. That harm is real. But it can't be considered in isolation when there's a claim of liberty of conscience on the other side. Religion is also a fundamental identity, as I've said. So penalizing the objector for his religiously driven conduct also imposes a significant dignitary harm. Bakers willing to turn away good business for religious reasons believe that they are being forced to defy God's will, disrupting the most important relationship in their lives, and commit a serious wrong that will torment their conscience for a long time. Whether we agree with that understanding or not, they sincerely believe it. These are, uh, that is among the harms that religious liberty is intended to prevent. And the customer's sense of being rejected or disapproved of does not make a compelling case for inflicting such harms. In a concrete way, the harms to the baker are greater, in fact. 
Let me explain that. Couples who obtain their cake from another baker still get to live their own lives by their own values. They will still celebrate their wedding, they'll still love each other, still be married, and still have their occupations or professions. If Jack Phillips, the baker, loses, he will not get to live his own life by his own values. He must repeatedly violate his conscience, making wedding cakes for every same-sex couple who asks, or he must abandon his occupation. The harm of regulation on the religious side is permanent loss of identity or occupation. That permanent harm is greater than the one time or more limited in time harm on the couple's side. Uh, now, let me emphasize, none of those arguments justify religious exemptions for larger, much larger businesses or those with market power whose refusals could limit couples' material access to goods or services. Nor do those arguments justify protecting the restaurant owner who refuses to serve a same-sex couple and would be refusing service there in a context with no nexus directly to the behavior or the event that he or she opposes. Now, those are, in some sense, uh, might be seen as fine distinctions, but they can be made, and I think that they're worth making by courts or by legislatures, however it's done, if we want to value both religious freedom and same-sex marital rights. Now, you may not agree with me about this case of the baker or the commercial service provider, uh, and we can discuss that. Uh, I hope, though, that out of this, uh, I, would at uh, you, uh, I would at least be making the point, whatever you think the result should be in that case, that we should take religious liberty seriously and weigh it heavily in the balance. Because there are many, many other cases coming down the pike. They are the religious colleges. They are the, the Catholic schools. They are the social service agencies, the adoption agencies, the international relief agencies, uh, and in some cases, churches. And uh, so, of course, we'll be deciding these for, for a long time, and we can either take religious liberty as a strong value in those cases or not, and I think we should. Religious liberty should temper our disputes, not replicate and reinforce them. We should uh, support religious liberty even for the thought we hate. And if we fail to do so, religious liberty will lose credibility as a principled source of protection for anyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, the parallels that you drew between uh, uh, arguments for marriage equality and religious liberty were quite striking, particularly with respect to the fundamental interest in personal identity. Um, could you address in more detail one issue that you mentioned uh, briefly? Um, the exclusion by uh, Catholic adoption services of otherwise uh, qualified gay couples from having access to uh, adopting a child. One could argue that that is uh, central to their fundamental interest in defining their marriage, and that Catholic adoption services functions as a choke point in some contexts. Uh, on the other hand, there are certainly uh, deeply held views about the best interest of children on the part of the Catholic Church and the, the uh, nature of marriage. So uh, could you address the competing interests in that case? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I would go back to the two uh, factors that, to me, they're not the only factors, but the ones that I, that I emphasize, because I think they do uh, summarize a lot of the interests that are most important in these cases, and that is uh, notice and alternatives. So let's start with alternatives first. Um, in the case the cases that we've had so far, which have come out of Boston and San Francisco, uh, and I'm forgetting where, oh, uh, Illinois, um, there were multiple providers of adoptions. Uh, it, it, 
I don't, I don't remember what the numbers were, but at least a dozen or more, I, I believe, for any couple that was seeking to adopt uh, beyond Catholic Charities. Uh, it was, you know, a case where there were not hundreds of alternatives like the colleges in California, but a lot of alternatives. Um, so I think that weighs against the, uh, that weighs in favor of uh, Catholic Charities. We can operate this program we can, uh, and, and, and still give same-sex couples a, you know, a, a, a nearly total ability to adopt without imposing on Catholic Charities beliefs, and in the end, driving Catholic Charities from the program, right? uh, which, is, which is what happened. Uh, they, they dropped out. Um, notice, I don't think, is a, is a particularly strong feature there. I, I, I think that, you know, the, the the student who attends a Christian college and learns that they have a policy that they haven't enforced before or, or they haven't mentioned, and then is expelled or you know otherwise uh, affected, that that you know that's a that's a harm. That's a that's a significant harm. Um, but I don't think that the same-sex couple uh, you know has the same kind of uh, you know reliance or gets involved in the same way and faces the kind of surprise or. Uh, springing uh, a, a regulation on them in the adoption context. So when there are alternative providers, I would tend to support Catholic Charities right. Um, if there's not, then it's a different, it's a different situation uh, because we do have a, a real interest in everybody having access to adoption services. Quick, quick follow-up, yeah, sure. are, there, are there cases in which uh, there are waiting lists where there is actually an, a choke point for gay couples seeking to adopt? And if so, would that constitute a basis for um, uh, infringing upon the religious liberty of those who choose not to? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know the case as well, um, so, uh, I, but if there if there are choke point situations like that, then I have a different attitude. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of this in terms of the practical ability of both sides as much as possible to live out their lives and not just live it in private. Uh, and uh, that's you know that that I think is is, is is the way the balance should be struck. There, but I don't know factually whether there are choke point cases. Maybe there there may be in some in some situations. Yeah, I also enjoyed your talk a lot. I think uh, there's one point uh, of disagreement, and maybe it's a, a pretty big one. You you talked about personal identity and maiden equivalency, as I understand it, between somebody who is homosexual and somebody who has religious belief that opposes certain kind of behavior such as baking a cake for a same-sex wedding. Uh, one of those is learned behavior and the other is not. I don't see them as equivalent. Uh, religious beliefs are learned behavior. So to me, the discrimination argument is still valid. What you learn, you can also unlearn. Just be interested in your response to that. Um. Yes, I mean it can be unlearned, um, but and that's that's why I said the issue is not what's what's possible to change or not. Um, it's what is painful to change, and what does our constitutional system recognize as painful to change? Um, it seems to me that a premise of religious freedom is that religion is a matter that ought not to be changed by, fundamentally, by government pressure. It happens other ways, yes, and the, um, the, obviously the attitudes are changing on, on same-sex relationships. Personally, I think that's great. I belong to denominations that have done that, and that's why, one of the reasons why I'm in those denominations. But it doesn't happen because the government says it, or it doesn't happen in any way authentically because the government says it. You know, over the years, people have said, 
you can change someone's religious beliefs. I mean, you know, Augustine said that in the in the 400s. You might get actually a real a real ultimate change in somebody's religious beliefs by pressure, by coercion. They could be led to the truth by coercion. Um, I think religious freedom rejects that premise. So I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's very painful. And the premise of religious freedom is that it it, it shouldn't be the government that's doing that. Um, so I guess that's my answer. I, my question is, uh, how, how, do you, um, uh, how do you see the case for Hobby Lobby being, you know, trying, and, and other like closely held organizations or even um, closely held, or, or even corporations, larger corporations that are public, publicly traded, at what point does religious liberty allow people, you know, organizations, businesses to deny reproductive um, birth control to employees, and at what time, and at, at what cost? Right. Th yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, so, very briefly, maybe a, a, a one more quick background about this case for those who, who uh, didn't follow it as, as closely. Uh, this was the mandate of the uh, Health and Human Services Department under President Obama uh, that employers cover contraception in insurance coverage. Some employers opposed all contraception. Some opposed certain forms that they believe would cause an abortion of a new embryo, uh, uh, emergency contraception, so on. And they sued. Uh, to block the enforcement of the mandate against them. They relied on RIFRA, the statute that I mentioned. Uh, the first case was Hobby Lobby, the large craft chain, uh, a uh, family-owned business uh, with 13,000 employees. So not a small, not a small vendor, right? Uh, and the second case was by the Little Sisters of the Poor and uh, a bunch of other religious nonprofits and charities and colleges and so on. The Supreme Court ruled for Hobby Lobby in an extremely controversial decision. And I show students in my class slides of people protesting outside Hobby Lobby stores. You don't usually see protests, uh, large people lined up waving signs in front of a craft store. Uh, but it, 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 it's the case here. It was a very, you know, really controversial decision. Uh, but here's what the Supreme Court said in the decision. The close, closely held corporations could sue, um, and the government lost, but they didn't get the right to deny contraception to their employees. What they got was the right to be to receive an accommodation that the government had already given to charities and nonprofits. And that accommodation was the insurer pays. The employer is taken out of it and the insurer pays. Now you might have, and the Obama administration had done that for nonprofits and the Supreme Court said, it works, it works there, it should work for these companies too. Now, how, you might ask, you know, how you just tell the insurer to pay? Uh, it's because contraception actually, uh, by the administration's own arguments, and this is the premise of the mandate, contraception reduces, reduces the overall uh, costs of, of, of coverage. And so the, the uh, insurance company can take that uh, extra cost because it's going to uh, pay out less, uh, ultimately. That basically worked for nonprofit agencies, and the result of it was that the female employees would, once that was instituted, get exactly the same coverage as they, ha as they would have had under the mandate. In that context, the Supreme Court said, we don't see a good enough reason for imposing on even a, even a large business. Um, now, I think that was right, uh, because you know, they, the Supreme Court found a way to kind of a win-win, as, as, as I was talking about. Um, I don't think that the administration should have or needed to uh, Un, undone the ma should have undone the, the mandate the, the way it did last week for such a wide range of employers. Because now it's saying you really can deny coverage. And the insurer doesn't even have to pay. And these employees will go to the exchanges or they'll go to government funding 
sites to get government provided contraception or et cetera. Uh, you know, I think the Supreme Court reached a good compromise in the Hobby Lobby case, and I don't think the Trump administration should have undone it. Uh, un undone it, is that right? That sounds weird. Uh, I shouldn't be talking in a convoluted way like that. Um, uh, but notice what, you know, notice what that statute RIFRA did in that case. It took a hard line dispute between corporations can't be covered and we should never have to pay for everything, for, you know, for anything uh, that we don't want to pay for. A very hard-nosed, hardly uh, defined positions and it found a way to protect both. It was pushed to do that by the existence of this statute. And if we don't have that statute, then the courts won't be pushed to find a way of accommodating both interests. So that's how I think of that. How do you see the current legal trends regarding religious liberty as they would affect folks who might be agnostic or an atheist? Uh, uh, yeah, religious liberty for atheists and agnostics. Uh, so we've been talking about cases in which the government regulates an organization or an individual, and the question is, can they object to that regulation? Um, atheists might have objections to regulation in some cases cases. The, 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 the cases that were most, that are most uh, best known in the Supreme Court were the Vietnam era objections to the draft. When suddenly people started objecting to being drafted who were not traditional Quakers or Mennonites or, you know, the kind of traditional religious pacifists that everyone was familiar with, but kind of secular minded people who just thought that killing was wrong, and they weren't atheists so much as agnostics. The Supreme Court there expanded the concept of religion to cover agnosticism, essentially. That if you have a, a, a view about uh, the, the, the morality of killing that is a fundamental, you should never kill, but that's not because God says so, because you don't know if there's a God, and, and it, et cetera, uh, they were still protected under a, under, under a broad reading of religion. There hasn't been a case like that in the Supreme Court for a long time. Uh, so we don't know what the Supreme Court would do more, you know, what this Supreme Court would do. The other cases that affect the rights of atheists are a different kind of case, and that is government's own promotion of religion. The Ten Commandments in the courthouse, the uh, prayers at, grad at graduation from a high school or in the classroom, uh, and there, um, uh, you know, the, the atheist's interest is being free, in, free from a government imposition of religion. The Supreme Court has protected that in a lot of previous cases, especially in the, in the schools, less so outside of public schools. Um, I think there's a real possibility that those cases will get relaxed a lot, that there will be more permission for government-sponsored religion. Uh, I don't view that as a good thing. What I'm arguing for here in religious liberty is not pro-religion and religion gets to win whenever it wants. Um, I think religious liberty means religious liberty for the atheists from government imposed uh, symbols or prayers or whatever too. So if the court went in that direction, I, I would view it as, as, uh, as, as, as bad. And um, a lot of people would say it's, Doing that, you know, having more religion in government that government imposes, it goes right along with protecting the free exercise of religion because it's all about whether re religion gets protected or not. Um, or the other side would say it's all about stopping religion from getting, getting what it wants. I don't, that's not the way I think our First Amendment looks at it. Our First Amendment values privately initiated religion from people, from individuals and groups, and protects that. But it prohibits government-sponsored religion. And so we ought to do both of those things.
Thank you. I, I just have a comment. One of the things that, and I've really enjoyed your, your talk tonight. Um, it's been very enlightening and thought provoking. But you did make a comment about um, Hillary Clinton saying that the laws that were passed in 2015 by both Arkansas and I believe Indiana, um, even though they were word for word, almost verbatim to those that her husband signed in 1993, that she classified those laws as sad. And I think it's unfair not to put the enactment of those laws in the context in which they were enacted, which really was to support businesses that want to discriminate against same-sex marriage and against gays. And I think ultimately, as you know, the Indiana law and the Arkansas law were both amended and passed in keeping with your recommendation, which was to not only recognize the right of religions to, to you know, enforce their rights as they see them, but also allowed for um, anti-discrimination provisions in those laws, and they were passed and then supported. So I think it's important that when you, in your talk, speak of um, Hillary Clinton's comments, that you put them in the context in which they were really made. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. that that's, that's, a, that's a really, like, really knowledgeable comment, and, and so I appreciate it. Um, uh, not that the others weren't knowledgeable, but, uh, but, but so um, I guess I'd say a couple, uh, I'd respond a couple of ways. Um, the, whatever the motivation was for passing the law, we have to look at what the law would actually do. And it wouldn't give any kind of wide right for businesses to reject gay rights laws. It just, these laws had never been interpreted to do that. They had lost most of the cases, I think all of the cases, even in the wedding context, they had lost. It certainly wouldn't give the much broader right that everybody predicted. What it would have done was protected Sikhs and Mennonites and Muslims and so on. Uh, so we should look at, you know, not at, less at the motivation and what the law would would actually do, and I don't think she did that. Um, and, and I don't mean to single her out, I just meant to compare her to kind of President Clinton's uh, a attitude as more as a sign, not that she's being inconsistent, but that there's what's happened in 20 years. The views of, are totally different in 20 years. Um, you're right that the, the Indian law was ultimately passed with no protection for even the small wedding vendor. I think the small wedding vendor should be protected in those limited cases. The Indiana law took it out in, entirely. Um, and so I don't think that was good. And, and, and it, to me, raises um, the possibility, which we've seen in other instances, that once you start amending the law for one claim, they'll multiply. The next group will come in and say, okay, it's the cruelty to animals that, we're, that is really bad, and we've got, to, we've got to exempt that. And the next group will come in and say, yeah, but prisons, religion in prisons is really dangerous, so we better exempt that, and some states have done, have, have done that over the years. No religion claims by prisoners. I should make clear that the issue here is not whether the, per, the claimant wins under one of these statutes. It's whether they get to make a claim at all and ask the court to analyze whether there's a really a strong reason for protecting them. So I don't think we should start making exceptions to the laws. Um, we should let everybody make the claim under the same standard. That's what I think religious freedom for all means. But, but I mean, you, you're, you're right about the context of what she said. Energetic youth. <laughs> Real simple. Uh, historically, how could, the, how, how could the government outlaw polygamy? Um, you mean what was their authority or power to do it? Well, or? it was actually it was a Mormon belief, and then the then they said, okay, fine. They passed a law that said you could, it, polygamy was illegal. Right now, isn't that completely, you know, controlling religion? Yeah. 
Um, and I suspect yeah, if you take it right now, they would probably win. Uh, it, it's a different, it's a different situation. Uh, it, you know, uh, it was in the 1880s that the Supreme Court said no right to practice polygamy just because it's your religion. Um, it's reaffirmed that a couple of times in the 20th century too, although it's still a number of years ago. Um, with uh, changes in family law and marriage law and everything in the last 20 or 30 years, I probably think polygamists have a, a better claim. They can point to other kinds of deregulation of the family uh, and say, well, why shouldn't we get to uh, live the way, you know, uh, have a, a family arrangement too? I do think that there are distinctions between the two cases, uh, uh, but but they have a better case than they did. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it made it. Do you want to talk about the distinctions between the two cases, or is I, I don't want to cut off your question. No, I was, you know, it's just, to me, it appears to be completely con uh, control of religion. I mean, the government went in and said, okay, fine, the norms of the, we don't believe in polygamy, and it's illegal. Uh, you can quit it. Yeah, yeah. And they were about ready to confiscate all of the property of the Mormon church, including the Mormon tabernacle in Salt Lake City, uh, by uh, having declared the Mormon church as a criminal conspiracy. They were going to confiscate all of their assets, uh, and that's when the church changed its position. Um, that was changed under government pressure. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's one of our greatest moments that we forced that change uh, by government pressure. Um, but uh, the, uh, the other interesting thing about the Mormon case is that the Supreme Court said, we're not even sure that Mormonism is a religion. Are we hearing that at all today? I'm not uh, about any other faith. I'm not even sure that Islam is a religion. Maybe it's just a political view. We have a history of taking faiths that we disagree with and trying to you know, dismiss the idea that they're devoutly believed um, and that they have the, the kind of diversity of thought and real philosophical and religious depth to them because we don't like some, manif because some manifestations of them are bad, which you could say about a lot of faiths. Any last questions? Okay. Any last well, thank comments? you very much. Wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. And uh, drive safely.